Welcome all. Uh, I presume you know why you're here. So this is the joint meeting of the Sabre Detroit or Southern Southern Michigan now, Cleveland, Chicago, Minneapolis, and Kansas City chapter. And um, we did this once last year. It worked pretty well. And we're doing it again. So there's a loose structure here. Each team is going to have one or two people speak briefly, total of five minutes uh, about their team and maybe pontificate or maybe just prognosticate at the start. And then we're going to open it up to questions and comments and it sort of be just freewheeling. We expect everyone to be gentlemanly and mm -hmm. not interrupt and not, but also not to monopolize a conversation uh, once we once we turn it over. I do not have anyone on mute. So if you can be careful about background noise, it would interfere with other people. Uh, but otherwise I'm not gonna mute people even during the speakers. And we're now up to 37 people. And I will, oh, yep, another one. You got another one of our speakers here. So we're now up to 38. Okay, so I'm gonna start the meeting. If you don't know, I'm Gary Gillette. Yep. I'm the founder of the Detroit chapter 2006. I've been president and chair of the chapter. Um, since then, we became the Southern Michigan chapter a few years ago when we absorbed Grand Rapids. And we also had absorbed along the way the former Southeast Michigan, Southeast Michigan chapter. Um, we're gonna go in order of last year's finish in the AL Central. Somebody's got some background noise you need to mute or I'll have to mute everybody which I don't want to do. Um, we're going to go in the last, last year's order of finish for the speakers. And then after the speakers, it'll be open mic. So uh, let me introduce our first speaker here. Uh, well, for Minnesota, we're going to have two speakers. Gene Gomes, who was co-chair of, of a couple of Halsey Hall chapter committees. Halsey Hall chapter being one of Sabre's very, very best chapters. He's a longtime twin season ticket holder. And he will be speaking along with John Buckeye, who is presently on the Halsey Hall Chapter Board of Directors. Um, Gene and John, welcome and take it away. Hey, Gary, thanks a lot. Hello, everybody. Happy opening day, of course. Um, quickly, I just like to say that uh, people in the Twin Cities are pretty pumped about the Twins this year. Uh, looking back at last year, it was a real, real successful year. Uh, the Twins broke their 19-game playoff game losing streak by, by sweeping the mighty AL East Toronto Blue Jays in the wild card round by scores of three to one and two to zero, showcasing their two tough starting pitchers at the time. This scenario of 2023 for the Twins was not foreseen by most prognosticators last year. ESPN, for example, uh, had Minnesota second uh, to Cleveland in their predictions. Uh, Bleacher Report had the Twins third behind uh, Cleveland and Chicago. Uh, Sporting News had uh, the Twins second behind Cleveland. Um, on, a better, on a better predicting note, Fangraphs, Zips had the Twins by one game over Cleveland on opening day. 2023. They uh, they finished 87 and 75 last year after going 19 and 10 in September. So they finished strong. Uh, the Twins benefited greatly from their starting pitching in 2023. They uh, acquired uh, last January, you might remember, they acquired Pablo Lopez from uh, Miami for Luis Arise, and they uh, acquired an ace pitcher, no doubt. Uh, they signed him to a four-year extension last April. In 2023, basically this happened with the, the Twins pitching. Minnesota was number one in quality start percentage, 47%. Major League average was 35. And these stats are from baseball reference. Minnesota was number one in pitcher average game score, 55. Major League average was 51. The Twins were number one in bequeathed runners, the least number of runners on base when the pitcher left the game, 158 runners. Major League average was 220. 
Twins were number one in not allowing the bequeathed runners to score. So the bullpen did their job too. They only allowed 45 of them to score. Major League average was 72. The Minnesota starting pitchers averaged 5.5 uh, innings per start. That was third in the majors wow. behind, uh, behind Houston and Seattle. Seattle. Uh, and as far as relief pitching goes, um, well, the relief pitching, relief pitching wasn't too bad either. They ranked number five for percentage of inherited runners, which scored only 28%. Major League average was 32%. As an entire staff, the Twins ranked number one in the major leagues for strikeouts thrown. And of course, I watched a few Twins games last year, and I have to tell you, there were a lot of strikeouts. Uh, the Twins hitters led the majors in strikeouts. So they took they took that function to the highest level while watching their pitchers lead the league. So, uh, so what does this have to do with this year? As far as looking at last year, what, what do you think, I'm, Gene? Hey, what I, do you think it's going to mean for this year? I have no clue. Uh, <laughs> well, John, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the Twins pitching staff for this season, real quick. Oh my goodness. Hi, everybody. Yeah, I was running a little late. I am John Buckeye, uh, Halsey Hall chapter. Um, good to be here. The pitching for the Twins is uh, similar to last year, I think. We have a couple holes in the rotation that we <clears throat> lost to or have due to uh, Kenta Maeda leaving and uh, Sonny Gray, of course, runner-up in the AL Cy Young. But we still think that Pablo Lopez was already, always going to be our ace. Um, <clears throat> second in the rotation is going to be uh, Joe Ryan, the handsome well, that's proud to cut man himself. Mm -hmm. What's that? That's just an um, inadvertent um, off uh, no target. Just okay. go ahead. Yeah, yeah, keep going. Yeah, yeah Joe Ryan and uh, <clears throat> Chris. I would say people think of Joe Ryan and Bailey Ober as like number two A and two B. They could either of them probably be our uh, second best pitcher if things go right for them. Joe Ryan's deal is. He can look great at times, and he can look really average to mediocre at times. Um, but Bailey Ober might have a uh, higher feeling than him if lower floor, too. <clears throat> like, we pretty much kind of know what Joe Ryan's going to be at this point. And Ober is really tall, and uh, if he can, you know – Maintain command, gain command. He sometimes loses a little command, but um, he might even have better <laughs> stuff than Joe Ryan. And then our last two guys <laughs> are going to be um, ooh, Chris, Chris Haddock, who's coming yeah. off of another TJ. He's coming off his second TJ. Yeah. Uh, so he probably won't be pitching many more than 100 really a hundred innings this year, you'd think. Um, but we'll get them as much as we can out of him. And then Louis Varland, who before Anthony Desclafani went down, was probably going to start the year in St. Paul, but he's definitely in the starting rotation now. He made the trip. And, um, yeah. and, uh, and so that's basically our rotation. <laughs> our bullpen had... Can someone turn their microphone off, please? They lost our closer. <laughs> they lost their closer for a couple of months. Yeah, we lost our we lost our closer. Should I should I talk about bullpen gene? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, just uh, basically, I wanted you to mention the fact that they lost their closer, and then I could uh, maybe hit the 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 lineup real quick around the horn, and we can wrap it up. Yeah, we lost our closer. We still have Griffin Jacks and uh, Josh Stamont. Not going to be our second guy. Uh, Brock Stewart, beef to himself. 
they'll probably be our one, two until Duran gets healthy. And, uh, yeah. And also lost our lefty, uh, specialist, Caleb Thielbar, but got a few other guys that we're trying to replace him with for maybe the month that he's going to be out. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. What about, about the twins lineup real quick, we can sort of go around the horn, uh, starting at third base. Uh, the twins are going to start Royce Lewis at third. Um, he's uh, he has a career of 58 games. Well, 58 games last year, mm. uh, he had knocked in 15 homers. Uh, his nickname's Doctor Evil. So we'll see what happens with him this year. He was a first round pick in 2017. At short is Carlos Correa. He's coming off his career worst year. He's only 29, uh, but he looked shaky last year at times. At second. The Twins got a surprise from rookie Edward Julian. Uh, he had a 2.6 war last year as, as a rookie, and uh, he was a, a late-round draft choice uh, a few years back. Carlos, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, at second. Carlos Santana we recently picked up to play first, and he he's a switch hitter, and he'll play first base mostly, sharing it with Alex Kirilov. Kirilov's a young guy. He was a recent first-round pick, left-hand hitter, He'll play some first, but they uh, the new pickup, Santana, looks like we'll get the most time. Um, they look to get some power from Matt Walner, last year's rookie left fielder. He'll play uh, more games this year. He was a first-rounder in 2019. Bucks, Buxton, he's going to actually play center field this year and not just DH. Hopefully, keep your fingers crossed on that one. Uh, Max, yeah. Max, Kepler, yeah, Max Kleppler in right field, the German, he came on strong second half last year. He's in his walk year, so he'll be a free agent afterwards. And so uh, he's a lefty hitter, and with some uh, with an average of 260 last year, that was his career best. Uh, the Twins picked up a good backup in Manuel Margot from the Dodgers recently. Uh, he'll provide a real good fielding backup. Uh, catching is we still have the two from last year: Christian Vasquez, the veteran, 33 years old. But Ryan Jeffers uh, overtook him as a starter last year. He was uh, only 26. Uh, so that's uh, basically the outlook for the pitching staff and uh, and the starters. Uh, backing up as a utility infielder is Kyle Farmer, uh, the farm dog. Uh, he had 11 home runs last year for the Twins, which was a, a, a surprise. Uh, another backup in the outfield is Willie Castro. Uh, he came over from, I think, Detroit two years ago. And he really improved from when he was in Detroit. Twins were really pleased with him. So all in all, the Twins had 100, 152 different lineups in 2022. And I think, I don't have the exact figure from 2023, but I think they had more lineups than games played in 2023 with, with uh, Baldelli juggling everything. So that's, that's, what we would, uh, that's what we would wrap it up with. Right, John? Yeah. Yeah. Um... We would be remiss uh, if we didn't mention what happened today. Down a Royce Lewis for a little bit. So, so overall, I think the, the Twins, I think overall, are in a good position to repeat. But I don't personally, I don't quite see them maybe hitting eight, eight seven wins this year. Maybe, uh, maybe a couple of games over five hundred. And enough to maybe nose out Cleveland for the uh, for the title. So, really think? Yeah, it seems. Um, thank you, Gene. Thank you, John. It seems like uh, <laughs> everyone is everyone is picking the Twins for the AL Central. As I was surveying all the <clears> major <throat> major sources, folks, if you're going to clear your throat, <clears> throat> mute yourself first. If you're going <laughs> to talk to somebody in the background, please mute yourself. Um, and. Uh, the Tigers got a couple of first place votes, but not many. Anyway, I've already introduced myself. I'm going to talk about the Tigers for a couple of minutes. And I'm going to let my friend and colleague, Rogelio Castillo, take it over about the Tigers. So the Tigers uh, proved that hope springs eternal. Everyone in Detroit is incredibly optimistic this year. They see the potential talent of Torkelson and Cole Keith and uh, Riley Green and Parker Meadows and Tarek Skubal and Casey Mize and you name it, and they don't 
think that, of course, things are going to go wrong. This is the classic case. If you take last year's players who did well, project them to do well. <laughs> take last year's players who didn't do well and project them to bounce back and be replaced by somebody better, and you have a much better team. Unfortunately, virtually everyone, and I surveyed the athletic, the baseball prospectus, fan graphs, the Detroit Free Press, M Live, ESPN. I couldn't find a prediction in the Detroit News, but I'm not a subscriber. And pretty much everyone is picking a tiger for somewhere between 75 and 81 wins and for second or third place with only a handful of writers here or there picking the Tigers to win the division. Um, so, um, Rogelio, you want to uh, talk for a few minutes? <clears throat> yeah. Thank you, Gary. So one of the things that Gary was mentioning in some of the, the, the names among the prospects is that a lot of these names are still kind of, to me at least, it, it also shows in the data that they're still kind of rather uh, – unproven if you will and so the the tigers i think the way the aj hinch in terms of how he attacked the offseason by getting guys like shelby miller i really think that they're going to they were i think among they're in the top five last year in bullpen innings thrown and so i think the way that he has hinch has built out his bullpen this year it's going to be the same thing you saw that today with foley going out there and just kind of giving him a different look than um, just giving a different look than than Alex Lang, where he has a heavy sinker. He's going to let the defense do his thing. I personally think that there's some really good things about the Tigers this year offensively that you can hang your hat on, perhaps with Riley Green, but I, I Green and Parker Meadows. But I just think that the one thing that I, I'm cautiously optimistic about is whether or not the potential can live up to it. As, as Gary mentioned, I think the Tigers. Didn't really also didn't address getting a bat either um, in the offseason. So to rely on some of these numbers to come back, especially in a third base situation where you go, you kind of go cheap and then you're waiting for Ace Young, which there's no guarantees either. I think the Tigers are a lot of possibilities of just like what ifs. But right now, I mean, I think I, I, I predicted them to go 85. I was a little more optimistic than I, I realized, but at the same time, I think their their pitching is what's going to be the the key here. I think Terry Scoble is going to be a beast. I think their bullpen is going to be very good, but their offense, like today, for example, I mean, you have there. This is where it's going to struggle, and I think for Tiger fans to be cautiously optimistic, but I think it's going to be wait till next year to win the Central. Okay, Rahelio, thanks. Um, well, that's a Tigers wrap, and then next up, we're going to have. Joe Shaw talking about the Indians. Joe was president of Cleveland's Jack Graney chapter, as well as one of the leaders of Sabres Baseball Memories program. So Joe, take it away. Joe? Did we lose Joe? No, you didn't. No, I'm on now. I was muted. Uh, I was trying to respect what you said before to stay muted to avoid the background noise. Um, Appreciate it. Yeah. Happy to be here tonight and play the role of uh, chapter pinch hitter. Typically, when we have these and we enjoy being very much enjoy being a part of them, our our main man is uh, our resident journalist within the chapter, Vince Carreri, and sometimes plays the role of the secretary treasurer of our chapter. But tonight, Vince has a higher calling. He is facilitating a group conversation at a at a restaurant in downtown Cleveland tonight about. What could the effect of the type of mustard you serve in the ballpark have on your baseball team's performance and other baseball questions too numerous to mention? So Vince won't be, unfortunately be with us tonight. He he did send me a little note today and said, Joe, I'm counting on you tonight and please don't wear your Yankee paraphernalia. And I said, I will do my best. So I, I went to the back of my uh, wardrobe and got one, one of my many uh, Cleveland shirts. So again, I'm happy to play the pinch hitter role and, it's fascinating to to listen to our our first you know twins and tiger speakers because in in some ways the guardians are kind of on the other side of that coin and and like Gene did if you go back to this time last year we were oozing with optimism and enthusiasm in Cleveland because we had just come off a season where we uh, won comfortably over the twins in the regular season went in and 
swept the Rays in the first round and then took the Yankees to the to the line in the second round said okay we've got all these where they're one of the youngest teams in baseball and and look how good they did and they're going to be even better next, next year as they're a little bit older and then we'll just add a couple of bats uh, through the free agency which we did in the offseason with Mike Zanino and Josh Bell both of them uh cratered and they were gone uh midway if not earlier through through the season that coupled with uh, a, a number of pitcher injuries and some people young guys regressing not progressing led to a rather disappointing last season 10 games below 500 finish and so as we went through this past off season quite frankly and obviously everybody sees things in, in their own way but the, the impression i have and from what i've read with others that most of the action that the Cleveland baseball team went through was not about roster change as much as it was about management and coaching change because we lost our manager, Terry Tito Francona, after 11 seasons and arguably one of the, if not the most uh, revered manager in the recent and not so recent history in Cleveland. Got us so close to a, a World Series championship in 2016 and always pretty much every year had the team performing at a high level. So depending on who you listen to, he either retired or decided he needed to take some time off to, to get his health under, under control, which he's had significant health problems and play with his, his words, play with his grandchildren, which his version sounds kind of a lot like the Bruce Bochy storyline. And we know how that played out, but anyway, we have a new manager. His name is Stephen Vogt. Um, he came to the Guardians after an exhaustive, according to them, over 40 people they interviewed for the job. He has absolutely no management experience, one year of coaching experience last year for the um, the Seattle Mariners. I don't offer that as a criticism, but simply as a comparison. So we have a charismatic young man learning how to be a manager and taking a team that underperformed last year and seeing what they can do as far as moving forward this year. Again, with one of the youngest rosters in uh, age-wise in, in Major League Baseball. Uh, he uh, They also made a somewhat significant change in the coaching staff. About half the coaching staff was either let go or encouraged to move on and brought some new blood in, but kept some seasoned blood like Carl Willis, the pitching coach, and Sandy Alomar, the first base coach. So there's a blend of experience and youth and the coaching staff so off season that was probably the biggest thing that that kind of happened and you couple that with what we'll talk about here in a couple for a couple of minutes about the off season movement or lack there of the guardians and if you believe again kind of the synthesis of what you're hearing in the cleveland media and in the cleveland you know, tv and radio shows that certainly everybody's excited about baseball but the optimism for the guardians this year is significantly lower than last year with the kind of con as our tiger friend just said well if the following five or six things go right uh we, we will be in the hunt for for perhaps a, a playoff position at the end of the year and as gary was saying i've, I've checked a, a number of the prognosticators and none of them are picking the gardens uh guardians they're either a second or a third place finish uh uh, around 500, give or take a, a couple or three games, but certainly nothing in, in the 90 range. So why the, the lack of, of, shall we say, enthusiasm, so to speak, and, or optimism? Well, number one, in the offseason, the Guardians made no free agent acquisitions. They made it clear that they were going to stand pat with their roster of young guys. And they have a very you know, large number of young and raw talented players some of whom did well last year some of whom regressed um as far as as trades they only they made three trades and it's kind of interesting because it does also tell you something about the front office strategy um the the first trade they made was pitcher cal quantro who went to uh the colorado rockies who had had a good stint with cleveland some injury bugs here and there but did pretty well but they indicated they traded him because they didn't really feel that they could uh, afford him in, in 2024. And in turn, they got a, a low level uh, um, minor league catcher or, you know, pennies on the dollar, so to speak. And then a few weeks later, they announced a trade with the um, San Diego Padres for, to get right-handed relief pitcher Scott Barlow. 
And they in turn shipped one of their relief fishers, uh, uh, Del Santos, who again was making hundreds of thousands of dollars versus Barlow making millions. And Chris Antonetti said, quite frankly, the only way we could afford this trade was because we got rid of Paul Quantro or Cal Quantro and, and we recovered his salary. So really a, a strong message of a very constrained, no growth budget scenario. Then they went and traded with the Yankees for the Yankees previous number one prospect, uh, Del Florio, Del Florio uh, um, and center fielder with, um, or Esteban Floreal, excuse me, with uh, good speed, good defense, and great minor league hitting, but it could never be translated into as many stints with the Yankees, and he was out of options. They traded for him and said he will get time in center field, and that certainly kind of sent the message that some more change was about to occur, and right before the beginning of the season, they, uh, they uh, released um, the the center fielder, Miles Straw, that we got a few years ago in a trade with the Houston Astros. And he was a favorite of Terry Francona's because he plays gold glove level defense. He hit pretty okay in the he, beginning, but he forgot to hit over the last two seasons, including I think over two years he had a grand total of one home run. But Francona openly valued him for his defense and said any offense we get from him is a bonus. And apparently that's not the way the current management, the current coaching staff looks. So they released him and uh, he was signed to a $25 million multi-year contract by the Guardians a little over a year ago. So no one's going to touch that toxic contract. So he was uh, dispatched to the AAA team in Columbus. And um, so the, the message that just yesterday that was in the Cleveland Plain Dealer by Terry Pluto, one of the um, most respected and revered uh, 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 writers in our marketplace, said um, Interstate 71 that goes back and forth between Cleveland and Columbus is going to be filled with cars moving players back and forth between the minor leagues and uh, the uh, Guardians roster this year. So it, it's going to be forecast. There's going to be a lot of roster churn this year. And one of the one of the reasons for that is the Guardians have signed a gazillion young players for the position allegedly of shortstop. And uh, obviously not all of them can play shortstop. So who wins, who loses, who could be redeployed, who's going to get traded, who's going to get sent down. That continues to be being sorted out was started last year. It will continue this year. And one of those shortstops, Tyler Freeman, has already been reanointed as uh, you're going to learn how to play center field. So he's moving from shortstop to playing center field. So we'll obviously see him part uh, of, of the time this year. Um, from, from a you know standpoint of what, what are our strengths? Well, if people are healthy, the, the starting pitching certainly is a strength. Uh, the um, uh, last year, we had injuries to Shane Bieber and Tristan McKenzie, which really, really, really hurt us a lot. Bieber is, is, has been throwing extremely well in, in the preseason, and he'll start tonight. It's his fifth start for the Guardians slash Indians on opening day, which ties the record. Um, and uh, Tristan McKenzie, who was out most of the last year with an elbow problem, he has seen a good service in in, in uh, spring training so he will be um, be one of our starters and again uh, uh, a, a strength of the starting pitching staff both he and Bieber and of course the discussion around Bieber is will the Guardians trade him this year because they've openly said they can't afford to keep him after this year um, so will they trade him or will they let it play out this year if they're still in contention and then see him disappear at the end of the year but for whatever time we have him, and if he's he and Tristan are healthy, we have two good starting pitchers at the top of the lineup. We have two excellent young arms in Logan Allen and Tanner Beebe, who did exceptionally well last year. And again, there's hope that they will continue to progress, not regress this year. And then a name from the past was signed to be to come back to Cleveland to be the fifth pitcher, and that's uh, Carlos Cookie Carrasco. And he was picked. He had been uh, traded to the Mets and has come back to the uh, to the Indians. And he certainly was a fan favorite. And everybody's hopeful that he will be resuscitated, so to speak, and in a positive contributor, at least in the beginning of the season for the fifth slot. 
As far as our on the field players, certainly it starts with Jose Ramirez, one of the most, in my opinion, underappreciated players within all of baseball and a, and a player that's, uh, to me, should be in the conversation every year for most valuable player. He produces at that level. And then you've got Josh Naylor, who is a kind of a grinded out player, uh, plays first base and DHs. And uh, he'll, he, he certainly got a lot of power, showed that last year. Certainly Stephen Kwan in left field is our one, frankly, legitimate outfielder that, that we have that produces offensively and defensively. And Andres Jimenez, the second baseman, is in gold glove level, and there's conversation about he could end up going back to shortstop where he came from. We'll see about that. And then the younger Naylor brother, Bo Naylor, is catcher. He came up from Columbus last year, started slow, but as he got his uh, – feet on the ground and established he had a really good latter part of the season. There's great enthusiasm that he will be the long-term fixture of the Cleveland Guardians at catcher. Uh, the bullpen, or at least according to some of the people, say it's uh, in the media that's right now in shambles, meaning the, the pieces are still being sorted out. Emmanuel Class A did, uh, again, a very good job last year as a closer, but he was overused by Terry Francona. Most people would feel such that he had a significant number of losses, and that was part of what is that? led them to get Scott Barlow from San Diego Padres. Uh, the remaining pieces of the bullpen are pieces in movement and will settle out, and I think the thing going for us there again is we have a continuation in our pitching coach in, in, in uh, Carl Willis. It's not a, a new face trying to start things all over again. So, uh, uh, hopefully long-winded and hopefully somewhat coherent story about the, the Guardians. People, you know, are, as always, excited about baseball this time of year. We've got not only, you know, a, a new manager and, and some good young players, but uh, we've also got a stadium that's halfway through being okay. refurbished to the tune of about $300 million. So that that's exciting. Plus, our opening day occurs on the total solar eclipse day. So how could you beat that? <laughs> And uh, so um, in kind of uh, five minutes or thereabouts, Gary, that's kind of a person's view of the Guardians 2024. Okay, Joe, thank you very much. And um, I think we'll take a poll a little bit later and see how many people uh, pick somebody besides the Twins to win the division. Um, okay, so next we have the White Sox. Who the Tigers beat one to nothing today, although I wasn't real confident at the end. But uh, the Tigers relief pitchers shut the, the White Sox down. So Bruce Allardyce or Allardyce and Bruce, I'm sorry if I got your pronunciation wrong, is a member of the Emil, a, a member of the Emil Roth chapter, the editor of Sabres Origins of Baseball Committee newsletter, and a history professor. And he is going to illuminate us on what it's going to be like to be a White Sox fan this year. Oh, boy. <laughs> I'm sympathetic. I'm not making fun of you. I'm sympathetic. <laughs> well, I've heard uh, several of the speakers so far say that they were cautiously optimistic or that the fans are cautiously or optimistic about the new season. I haven't met a Sox fan yet who isn't uh, pessimistic about this new season. and. Nothing that I saw on opening day uh, today, uh, I think, would change that pessimism. Um, you know, the Sox last year, they um, were a major disappointment. Uh, some people thought that they had a chance to compete for the division. As it turns out, they lost 101 games last year, which was um, second only to uh, Kansas City in the division. Um, they basically had a fire sale halfway through the season where they got rid of uh, most of their pitching, actually. This is one of the things I'm going to be talking about a little more. Uh, but in the offseason, I think that's the more important thing. There were no major offseason acquisitions, which disappointed the fan base, I think, a lot. Um, basically, they made some acquisitions, but they were sort of scrap heap acquisitions. Um, they picked up Dominic Fletcher to play right field. He was the fourth outfielder, I guess, for uh, Arizona. Um, 
and he's projected to be just a little bit better than a replacement player in right field. Sadly enough, that's actually better than what they had in right field last year because they had two first basemen playing right field and a rookie who could, and Oscar Coas, who was uh, probably the worst defensive outfielder I've ever seen in, ma in the major leagues. Um, the basic problem with the Sox throughout the last couple of years is the farm system. Uh, they've had a feeble farm system for many years now. Um, they aren't bringing up the talent or even the talent to be backups to what talent they can get otherwise. Uh, they were ranked 26 in the, in the minor league systems uh, before the big trades they had. And they're still lower than average, even after trying to get some young players from other organizations. Um, the big change in the management over this offseason was uh, getting a new general manager. And this is uh, Chris Getz, and he seems like a very nice person. Uh, good guy, I'm sure. Then you know, I'm, I'm sure his wife loves him and everything. But um, <laughs> don't be too sure. Yeah, well, that's true enough. But uh, he was the head of the farm system that was so conspicuously a failure. So you got to wonder why is this guy promoted, and not just promoted. The Cherry Reinsdorf, who owns the White Sox, basically did not really consider another candidate other than. Chris Getz, an internal candidate. Uh, the reasoning was that Getz knew the system and he could hit the ground running. Um, there's a Kansas City connection with the White Sox. Mm -hmm. Getz was an uh, executive with uh, Kansas City and played for a little while too. Played with the Sox also. Uh, the manager, Pedro Grafol, was gotten from Kansas City. And uh, that's also been discouraging to the fan base because they say... <laughs> If you're going to get people from outside the organization, shouldn't you be getting people who organized a winning team rather than a losing team? In other words, you if you're looking for managerial talent or general manager talent, you should look to somebody who worked for, I don't know, the Atlanta Braves or the Los Angeles Dodgers or something, rather than somebody, rather than a, a franchise that frankly has been a little bit worse than the White Sox over the last couple of years. Um, so, um, the woes the Sox had last year were offensive, defensive, and pitching. Um, just to try and sum up, they were about the bottom 15% in each of those categories. Uh, the only, um, acquisition they got that had a really positive, uh, war last year, wins above replacement was Nicky Lopez at second base, and he was gotten mostly for his defense. Now, the Sox have been making moves in the offseason trying to get uh, guys from other teams who basically are bargain basement or fourth outfielders, fifth fifth infielders. And they've, they've been concentrating on defense, and Chris Getz has made that very clear. He says the defense was awful last year. we got to improve it. And it, it's true. The defense was awful, but they were next to the last in offense and next to last in pitching also. <laughs> now, the budget, now, the budget here is a, a consideration. The Sox are below average in spending. They have been for the payroll salary. Um, they're actually a little bit behind Minnesota in total payroll right now, uh, about midway through the division. But for Sox fans, they believe, rightly or wrongly, that Chicago is a big city. And they should, and the ownership should be able to afford a uh, higher payroll than the relatively smaller cities of Minnesota and Kansas City. Um, <laughs> given the budget considerations, maybe getting new defensive players is all gets good to afford. At least that's the only way I can figure it. Um, and of course, it's also a commentary that the Sox system couldn't even produce mediocre hitters who could field. They have to go outside the system to get those players. The Sox and Oakland have never are the only two major league teams that never signed anyone for six figures for a hundred million dollars. <laughs> so there's a lack of spending here and a hostility toward the owner. 
their Cactus League record wasn't keeping with uh, expectations. They were the worst in the Cactus League, second worst, ironically, to the Twins in Major League Baseball. Um, the lineup, Martin Maldonado, who's probably past his prime at catcher. Um, Moncada at third, who's often injured. Paul DeYoung at shortstop, uh, again, an acquisition, free agent acquisition. Nicky Lopez at second, good field, no hit. Uh, Vaughn stays at first base. Ben Attendee stays in left field. Robert, the one really good field player in center field. Added right to Dominic Fletcher platooning with uh, Kevin Pilar. Again, two basically scrap heap players uh, cobbled together. The pitching is even more interesting. The Sox have only one pitcher on their roster right now who was, was, was with them at the start of last season. Basically, they've gotten rid of the whole pitching staff. And they brought in some new guys. Uh, you know, they promoted a guy from the minor leagues who's never started a major league game. He looked real good today, by the way. So uh, there's some hope for optimism there as long as he stays healthy. Um, I think the pitching uh, is going to be mediocre. And the offense is going to be worse and the defense is going to be mediocre. What does that translate to? Um, well, again, like everybody else, I was looking at the predictions there. Fan graphs puts them at 67 and 95 and last in the division. And arguably the third worst record in Major League Baseball. Bakota, 66-96. The Athletics' Keith Law, 60 and 102. Team rankings, 64 wins. Ozzie Gian, the former manager, 62 wins. So there seems to be a consensus that they're going to be pretty awful. Now, whether some team in the division is going to be more awful, I'm not going to say, but um, Ozzie Gian was was on the TV yesterday, and he said, if this team finishes 500, Pedro Grafal should be manager of the year. Yeah, um, that seems, that seems like hard. a reasonable statement. Yeah, it's it's hard to look at this team and identify that any additions that will significantly improve the Cubs Cubs prospects in 2024. They don't really have anybody in their farm system is going to make a huge difference this year, certainly. And so uh, I think the consensus is that they're going to be near or at 100 losses again this year. Yeah, it's um, after this long dry spell in Detroit, I'm very empathetic, but. The, uh, there doesn't seem to be any hope in Chicago. And I guess um, Reinsdorf feels like he can get a deal for a new ballpark, even with a terrible club. Normally people assume you have to have a good club to push it over the top, over the resistance of the citizenry to the taxes and the spending. Yeah, the whole the whole new stadium thing is another whole other thing, which I, I talked a little bit before the... Uh... Things this started, and uh, we could, if somebody wants to ask a question later about the new stadium, I could talk on that for a while. But I just wanted to focus on the team on the field right now. Oh, yeah. No, no, you did a good job, a very depressing job, but a good job. <laughs> okay. So we're going to move on to Kansas City, who will be uh, our last um, uh, introductory roundup. And that's uh, Roger Erickson, who is the, has been the president of the KC of the Kansas City. Monarchs chapter since 2007 is a 35 year member of Sabre. Roger, take it away. Okay, thank you, Gary. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yeah, it was interesting what Bruce was talking about stadiums and the new stadium planned in Chicago. And of course, as I mentioned back in October, we are uh, voting on a new stadium on Tuesday. So what does John Sherman do, our owner? He decides to spend money. Bobby Witt got an 11-year contract with a three-year extension at over $140 million, becoming the first $100 million man in Kansas City history. We improve our woeful pitching on paper with the additions of Michael Waka and Seth Lugo in the, as, in the starting rotation to go with Cole Reagans, who was a revelation after the Aroldis Chapman trade. Brady Singer, who has not yet met the potential that he had coming out of Florida. And 
Alec Marsh, who has got a, a weird five pitch combination. Uh, the bullpen is improved with Will Smith, who seems like he touches gold and rings wherever he pitches. Chris Stratton, Nick Anderson is pitch, coming in from the Atlanta Braves. Kyle Wright will be coming in after his Tommy John surgery next year. And some people are considering us as a sexy pick uh, to win maybe 72 to 75 games, maybe contend, but you need a fast start. You know, if, and if you're a Royals historian, if you remember 1990, when we picked up both Mark Davis and Storm Davis, we got off to a horrendous start and that helped precipitate a nearly quarter century of non-playoff and competitive teams. Uh, the Royals still have, you know, and Bobby Witt, probably one of the most exciting players in the American League. Uh, they don't nickname him Bobby Baseball for nothing. But we need a quick start. We need, um, if the bullpen is halfway better than their five plus ERA. If the starting pitching is halfway better than the five plus, maybe we can see a 15 to 20 game improvement. Whether that'll be enough to be second or third, we'll see. First would be great, but if we finish second or third, Matt Quattara may be the manager of the year in the American League. As far as the new stadium, um, the money being spent is sort of the Royals' effort to get the new stadium bond issue passed. It is getting a lot of resistance from some of the neighborhood that will be affected by the people. Uh, Frank White, who is the county executive for Jackson County, Jackson County being the county representing most of Kansas City. Um, they worked around him on the deal, which he was not too pleased about in some public debates. Uh, and maybe Kansas City will be known as a baseball town again, unlike, unlike a football town. Um, if the Royals can start coming from behind to win, last year, we only won 20 games of our 50 sits in come from behind fashion. We had the lead in 53 games that we lost last year. If we can just do half of that, it'll be a marked improvement for the Royals. Was that a wrap, Roger? That's a wrap. Okay, great. Okay, thanks to all the speakers. And we're going to throw it open now for general comments, excuse me, and questions and answers. So who's up first? Joe. Uh, yeah, I, I, I wanted to make a, a comment. Gene, you put something, Gene Gomes, interesting in the chat box about <clears throat> the twins saying words to the effect of, they weren't going to sign any free, big free agent pitchers due to the the decrease in regional, national, the TV income. And, and thank you for doing that. I thought that was interesting, quite interesting on the Guardian side. That I thought the same thing was happening. Why the Guardians weren't spending any money in the, on the off season? And at our winter meeting, I asked that question of a uh, athletic reporter who covers the. Guardians and is very well respected, Zach Meisel. And he said, quite the contrary, Joe, the Guardians have a good feel for how much they're getting and their lack of activity in the offseason has, has nothing to do with money flow. It's just they don't want to spend any money. So thank you for putting that in. I had forgotten that element of the offseason story. So ours is just apparently 180 out of degrees out of phase with yours. Yeah, Joe, the, uh, the Twins, I believe, received $54 million last year from their regional uh, network. And I'm sorry I don't have the exact figure this time, but it was uh, like almost half of that uh, missing this, this coming year. 
Yeah, I, I, I was in your camp, and I was very surprised when Zach Meisel, the athletic uh, reporter, said that he he had inquired and felt that for Cleveland that was not the case. It was uh, decisions were made independent of money money flow, which I found fascinating. So thank you for putting that in. Sure. Oh, could, uh, somebody... I don't know oh. if I have anything oh. substantial to add to that, but just a few thoughts. I think there's just a lot of hard feelings from fans about, you know, this would have been the time to strike and really make a push to uh, take the team to the next level with free agent signings mm -hmm. and, uh, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I would also say we, since – you know, the exit of the Terry Ryan regime, we do have a front office that has shown a willingness to spend every last buck offered to them by the stingy pole lads. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> they're trying to, you know, they're trying their best to make it work. See the Carlos Santana deal which was only basically freed up because of the Jorge Polanco deal. And that's almost a deal that isn't even for the present. Like that some people were like, Oh, that's kind of maybe even uh, given us a more open window for the next couple of years kind of thing. <laughs> uh, who are the good rookies that you, uh... Uh, the Sox really don't have them, but in the division, do you have one rookie on each team? Some guy's not on the roster now is in a triple-A or double-A who is going to be able to contribute and contribute some big way during the year? Which team? Any any of the teams. Uh, for Detroit Tigers, you would have to look at the second baseman, uh, Colt Keith. And he has a name that you could easily, you know, reverse his first and last name. But just remember the C, Colt, comes before the K. <laughs> and uh, he's a pretty big guy, maybe 6'3", six, 6'4", six, uh, 210. He's probably in that 10 to 15 uh, home runs. And uh, he was given an extended contract. So he's on the, uh, the payroll for the next uh, seven years. So he would be one for the Tigers to watch. I think from a Guardian standpoint, one of the, and certainly we've got other Guardians fans on, they should jump in here, but uh, Kyle, and I hope, hope I'm getting his name reasonably correctly, Kyle Ma Mon Ma Monzardo, who is a power hitting uh, player that the, the Guardians picked up, I believe in a trade with the Rays. And uh, he he's really got power, but they didn't feel he was ready to, you know, open the season with the team. So he's on the Columbus to Cleveland shuttle. But all indications are that we will, if he plays reasonably well in Columbus, which is expected, we'll see him back in Cleveland sometime during the season. So he, he's one of those examples of a power hitter potential that the Guardians desperately need. Okay. Um, for the twins, uh, for the twins, somebody we didn't mention was uh, the big number one pick of uh, 2022, shortstop Brooks Lee. Uh, he's a switch hitter, and he hit 16 homers in the minors last year. And with the twins uh, usually succumbing to injuries, as most teams do, uh, he, he's going to probably get some playing time and make his debut sometime this year. Brooks Lee. Yeah, I hope he does. I have his tops rookie autograph card. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's in there. Yeah, um, Brenda, you had your hand up for a while. You want to talk? Um, sure, but I don't want to leave maybe the topic of the the rookies from the different teams like Kansas City and. Okay. Um, okay. So I'll be back. Okay. I have a new topic. Okay. Yeah, I just want to comment on, on uh, Colt Keith. The pressure on him is really tremendous, partly because the Tigers are so desperate for hope, partly because he's been hyped for a couple of years now, and partly because he's 
essentially learning a new position. He was moved from third base to second base last year. And uh, yet the Tigers, he's not a good defender. I mean, he's not a terrible defender, but he's not a plus defender. And so that made little sense to me to move him from a position he probably could have handled to a position he may not be able to handle. But they don't think that Jace Young, who is uh, was at second and now is at third, that he will be able to handle second in the majors. So they effectively swapped them. But I'm worried about that because Keith is a better hitting prospect than Young. And um, I always worry when you you take a good young hitter and give him a tough defensive assignment, I mean, that he may not be able to handle it. I always worry that it's going to uh, affect his hitting. But the Tigers are Gaga over Parker Meadows, who defensively and on the base path is brilliant. I don't see his bat being a major league bat, but they think he's made improvement. And um, they have a whole bunch of young pitchers, of course, with Jackson Joe being the one that everyone is really excited about. He is uh, the new Casey Mize, and that's sort of a dig and sort of a compliment mm -hmm. because so much excitement about Casey Mize a few years ago, but he made that starting rotation uh, out of spring training, and they think he's throwing hard again, and they think that he might actually have turned the corner, albeit many, many years later than people thought. Um, if Rogelio has something else to add about other minor leaguers, he should do it here. There yeah. he is. Yeah, I was just going to say, there's a guy like Kyder Montero because the Tigers have been – terrible for like there's i'm sorry for lack of better there's no other word to say it on the international side of things and yeah. they will kyra montero probably represents their uh, uh, the first chance to have a starting pitcher to make the rotation probably in quite i mean i i can't think of uh, maybe jar jurgens but beyond i mean in terms of from the internet from like from latin america it's been a while and and so Positionally, player-wise, too, the Tigers still are light years away from that. They, Roberto Campos struggled last year to put some ball, the loft on the ball. So, um, Wilmer Flores represents. I mean, I, I think Wilmer Flores is going to be. It, it just depends on his command and his fastball velocity is back to ninety-nine from spring training. So, we'll we'll see. But um, I, I still think that the Tigers, internationally speaking, it's just I, I hope that that, that changes, but. Quite frankly, it's still pretty atrocious. Okay. Anyone else want to talk about their prospects or even somebody else's prospects? I could mention I some I things. I can about talk the about the Sox's prospects if you want. Uh, you know, they they try to restock their farm system with some guys from other systems. Uh, it's a catcher named Cuero from uh, Houston. Young catcher seems to be a pretty good prospect. Um uh, Nastrini they got from Los Angeles, and uh, he's going to be the number five starter this year. Um, in their own system, a shortstop, a guy who was a number one draft choice a couple years ago, Colson Montgomery, he's the one everybody's talking about as the shortstop of the future or maybe the third baseman of the future. There's doubts as to if he grows bigger that he'll, he won't be agile enough to play shortstop, but uh, they seem to think he'll hit at every level. Uh, but Again, the farm system is thin, and frankly, most of the prospects right now are guys they had to trade for from other other organizations like uh, Quero. All right. Have we exhausted the prospect talk for now? Oh. I, w I wanted to mention that the Guardians have uh, Juan Brito, an infielder, who showed a lot of progress last yeah. year in Akron. And I would expect him to be up at some point. And uh, Chase DeLotter is probably the best hitter in the uh, 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 Guardians uh, farm system. And it wouldn't surprise anybody if if he emerged. He's He was at uh, single A last year, so he has some progress to go. But uh, those are the two prominent minor leaguers at this point. And uh, it's also worth mentioning that Gavin Williams, who um, is a big arm, uh, uh, he had an injury this spring, and but, uh, he, there's a good chance that he'll be back before uh, before the summer starts. So those are the three guys I would mention about that. I, I was going to say, one guy I do like in Cleveland system, too, that had a really good spring training, and I like his swing a lot, is uh, Kyle Manzero, yep. first baseman they picked up from Tampa. I really like that guy a lot. I think he, good stroke, good 
uh, he has developed a little more power, but I think he's a really good line drive hitter, and I really like his approach at the plate. He takes really good patient at bats, and I think the fact that the rule when they sent the rule five back to Arizona, I think that significates that I think Kyle's going to be in Cleveland not I, by probably by mid April, late April, I think personally. But I, I, that's a, a guy I really like in their system. And Gavin Williams, watching him pitch last year for Akron before he got called up for Cleveland. Man, what a curveball. The guy has a really good hammer 12-6 action on his curveball. I can talk a little bit about the Minnesota Twins prospects, seeing them in Cedar Rapids last year. Uh, Emmanuel Rodriguez was very impressive. Uh, Center fielder struck out a little, but hit a lot of homers. Rosario, the uh, first baseman, same thing. He was very impressive. Uh, Noah Miller, uh, who's a great uh, shortstop uh, prospect, all defense. Mm -hmm. Barely hit anything. And Noah Cardenas, who was named uh, Twins um, Defensive Catcher of the Year, and hit pretty well, too. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Brenda? Uh, uh, hey, uh, oh, Sherry, sure. oh. Sherry, Tom, Tom Hatt was trying to say something about Guardians. He has his hand up. Yeah. Yeah, I, I see that. I There are three people with their hands up. Been yeah. up for a long time. I was just going in the order. I see them on my okay. screen. Tom, did you want to, talk, you wanted to uh, comment? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Chase DeLatter and Manzardo did great last uh, fall in the Arizona Fall League, leading whatever the team they were on to the title game. And I remember the title game, watching it on TV, both hit a couple of home runs in the game. Um, the issue is, can they make it in the major leagues? Because without that, we have no power. But looking in hindsight, we had Anthony Santander, who I remember watching when he was at Akron and saying, this guy's going to be really good. He got hurt, so the Indians tried to sneak him through the Rule 5 draft, and the Orioles claimed him. And he's been a great power hitter for the Orioles yep. the last three or four years. Yep. We had Nolan Jones, hmm. who had a great year playing full-time for the first time with Colorado. He would, he would be your other power hitting outfielder. And there was a third uh, one. Another power hitter. Edison. Outfielder I couldn't, I forgot about. So I, I thought the the Indians front office has been great, but nobody's perfect and they, everybody makes mistakes. So there's three mistakes right there. Yep. Will Benson was probably the other guy you're thinking of. Yep. Yeah, yep. Will Benson. Thanks, Tom. Okay, I'm ready to ask my question to people. Go ahead, Brenda. It, thank you. In Minnesota, um, the legislature is considering some laws that would allow sports betting, all kinds of stuff related to that. And um, I know that this is a huge source of income already for Major League Baseball, and that a lot of states um, already have sports gambling and but I don't know how many in the central division have this sports gambling because I mean I know they're sharing them some of that money <laughs> with the teams well Detroit has sports gambling I mean uh, while nominally the uh, Marion Illich and her who owns a motor city casino in Detroit is not on the Tigers deed uh, it's just a fiction that she doesn't have uh, some influence in how the club is run. I mean, her son is the owns the club nominally, so I mean, it's really a family operation. And there's a sports book at Comerica Park now, I believe. Uh, and the the ads are everywhere in Detroit. Yeah, the well, well, as far as uh, AL Central teams go, Ohio is the other one, but Missouri, which is where the the Royals are, um, do not does not have it as of yet. And so, yeah. Um, and then Chicago, yeah, Illinois is also active as well. 
you know, there will there will be a gambling spot in the re renovated progressive field somewhere. Is that going to be associated with the Jack uh, with the, um, Jack Casino and what have you? I don't know. I okay. I'm sorry, right? I just don't know. I'm so disgusted oh. by the whole thing. I failed yeah. to pay attention to it. No, I don't. I don't blame you, Joe. I don't blame you. <laughs> the the, the yeah. ads are the ads are out of control. It's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and it's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. Joe, um, I just have a question about the Indians' renovations. Are the Indians saying that it, when they're done with them, that it'll be it'll give them more budget flexibility to compete, or just without them, they couldn't compete? Do you mean the, the progressive field rehabilitation? Right. So, right. Yeah, well, um, I, I think they 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 use the words competitive. We have to have, have a competitive environment for our players, our fans. The game experience needs to be better than it is today, and and we need to open up more opportunities for people to come in and buy a beer, talk, gamble, and catch a few innings. I don't quite say it as crudely as I just did, but um, <laughs> but it, it's been more post of around the the fan experience and to be competitive with the other um, uh, the, the other teams in baseball, as far as the fan experience. And I, I personally, and I'll, you know, I'll certainly yield to other colleagues from Cleveland on the phone here, but I don't remember any saying, boy, once we get this, uh, uh, rehab progressive field, uh -huh. we're going to be more attractive for, uh, getting more players, more free agents. I haven't seen that verbal connectivity myself and I, I may have missed it, but I haven't seen it. I believe the Guardians have said that they were asked by baseball not to put a, a gambling parlor in this in the stadium. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I I hadn't seen that day because the last time I I saw was that it would be here sometime this year. So that that's interesting. Okay, good. I hope Bob, you're right, Dave. I hope you're right. <laughs> Bob, are you? you know, uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Bob. Okay, thank you. Um, my uh, question is for the uh, Detroit people, though. Um, the Spencer Torkelson, this is Spencer, Spencer Torkelson's third year, and I recall seeing him play a few times at Arizona State, where he was an absolute monster of a first baseman, though. But um, looking at his OPS, um, it's subpar, it's under 800. His war is, um, uh, for last year, it was... Um, Point eight. It wasn't even one. And in his first year, he had negative war. I'm curious um, what the Tigers' plans are for him, though, because this is a, somebody who appeared to have all kinds of potential, but after two full seasons in the, in the majors now, um, he just looks like a bust, really, though. Uh, Bob, that's a great, great question. And honestly, it's, I mean, that's why I think the Tigers went out and got Mark Canha as a backup because I mean, last year, I think torque by necessity, not because of, because the Tigers didn't really have a backup plan for first base last year played, I think over 140 games there. And right now he hasn't squared up one fastball since spring training. I know spring training doesn't matter, but he just seems like he's laid on everything again. And I mean, while the, the power is great and everything, the simple thing to me is there's sometimes there's just these laps in the game and Gary, I think you we witnessed this a couple times last year where he just has stone hands out of nowhere. And it's just been kind of for being a first round, you know, first overall pick, I expect I expected to hit a little bit higher for average and, and be able to draw more walks, but there's sometimes where he just gets blown away by a center cut fastball. And I don't know. Um as far as a backup plan goes, I mean, I'm surprised the Tigers haven't looked into, they have a prospect by the name of Justin Henry Malloy, who is kind of, I mean, he's been playing third. He's they have him in the outfield. Good kid. He's got a good eye at the plate. Can square the ball really well, but they haven't given him any reps at first base. But beyond that, the Tigers don't really have much in terms of internal options right now at first base that, I mean, Jose Bassanio is a guy who is a few years away, but he's looked really good in camp. But right now he's designated as a catcher for now, but he's six four, two twenty. I mean, the guy barely fits in catcher gear, but yeah. <laughs> we'll see. Right. I think the thing with Torkelson is you have to know that of course he was terrible his first year, but the Tigers handled him with kid gloves. And last year he got off to a very slow start. So his overall stats last year don't look very good, but 
after I think mid May, they're much better. And the second half, mm -hmm. he looked really good. But even looking good, he was hitting for power. He, he had terrible defense last year by the standard metrics, defensive run save and that. And um, although the Tigers are really impressed with his ability to pick throws out of the dirt and to save throwing errors, his defense is, was not good by the metrics. And um, of course, he's just not um, hosting a high enough bat. If he had a higher batting average, they could live with his mediocre on base. He had a higher on base, they could live with his poor batting average, but he doesn't have either. So uh, I think a lot of Tigers fans feel he's going to break out and become somewhat of the player he was expected to be when he was drafted. But I think it's still an open question. There's just too many holes in his game, including his, his ability to just hit fastballs over the plate, which is perplexing. Yeah, that's that's... Yeah, that that's remarkable though, because I mean, first base, it is. first base is supposed to be your 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 production, your your power of a power position though, and um, if he can't do that, I mean, you know, how is he going to survive in the major leagues? Yeah, I th I think this is his make or break year. He um, uh, the Tigers are still cosseting him, but I I don't think they can go another year if they want to be contenders, waiting for him to develop. Now, personally, I think he's going to get better this year. I think his improvement last year was real, but I also don't think he's ever going to hit the ceiling that everyone, literally everyone, projected of him in the draft. I don't think there was anyone who thought he wasn't going to be an all-star and a really good hitter, and a lot of people thought he was going to be an MVP caliber player. I don't think they were ever going to see that, but I do think he's going to be better than last year and will be good enough to play every day, even if he's not a superstar. And yeah, remember the yeah. comp, the comp Gary was, he had the swings similar to uh, Paul Conurco. Hmm. That was one hmm. thing that was out there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, Thank you. Brenda, are you, are you done for now? Or do you have something mm -hmm. else you want to say? Well, I do have something I want to say. I'm just, to make sure everybody remembers that if you want to see somebody was talking about, was that in um, Cleveland where there was going to be a lot of movement between the triple A team and the, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That was good comments. And um, in Minnesota, they only have a couple, a few miles to go for that. So it's, it's definitely an advantage for the twins to have the saints right here at their triple A team. And it's it's good for the fans because you can go see some of those prospects. Yep. Yeah. But it's... um and you too can come and see them if you come to yeah. the the Saber convention. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Oh that that was nice. I love the way you got that in there. <laughs> yeah, the ad for the Saber convention. That's worth the price of admission tonight. I see <laughs> I see a fair amount of gray and white hair on the Zoom here, like mine. Uh, many of us can remember when teams had farm clubs that were 2,000 miles away. Marlins had a team in Edmonton for, I yeah. believe, it was Edmonton for years. Yeah. The, Philly, the Phillies were in Portland for years. The Pirates were in Hawaii back when Hawaii had a AAA team. <laughs> um, it, it was just amazing. And now all the almost all the clubs have their cl their teams clustered around them, which makes perfect sense to me. Mm -hmm. and the, the Phillies have one of the premier um triple a club one of the premier minor league clubs in the lehigh valley draws well everyone loves it it just uh, an hour up the northeast extension of the pennsylvania turnpike then to go see players yet for for 20 years or something they blocked anyone moving in there because they didn't want anyone competing with uh the vet and they they did have a club in scranton which is not terribly <laughs> far away but not close either and um and then they had a falling out with Scranton before they finally went to Allentown. It reminds me of what Winston Churchill said about Americans, you know, we'll do the right thing only after we've exhausted every other choice. <laughs> so, Joe, you still have your hand up. Yeah, you I, I wanted to go back just briefly to the gambling thing in, in, <laughs> at Progressive Field. I, I looked it up and uh, Dave is absolutely right. And I'm quoting from MLB right now. 
Fanatic Sportsbook will be lo is lo not will be is located directly outside the right field gate of Progressive Field, open daily, including home game days, and offers four betting kiosks, a betting counter, and seven TV monitors. So it is right outside of right field gate. So Dave, you were right. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, I mean, a little bit. There's no question that MLB is all in on gambling. Yeah. And and I I actually think that gamble as the RSN and TV revenue goes down, that a lot of clubs, particularly the small market clubs, are going to really um go they're going to depend on gambling revenue and that worries me. Someone mm -hmm. and I, I it scrolled off my screen so I can't see. Someone uh, typed in the chat maybe we're going to need another 1919 scandal to, you know, bring people to their senses. I think we're going to get a 1919 Black Sox style scandal sooner or later and probably sooner. Yep. Um, that's a, that's even assuming the Otani thing doesn't blow up. Yeah. You know, the Otani thing that MLB sort of skates just with some egg on its face. I think we're going to get a big scandal because it's inevitable that clubs are just, they are milking this for every penny. And aside from the fact that a lot of marriages are going to be broken up, um, from uh, particularly from prop bets. I mean, and aside from the fact that a lot of um, kids' college funds are going to be drained by uh, dad trying to win back the money before mom notices that the cookie jar is empty. Um, yeah. I, I really, I'm really worried about this. It's already distorting the game. Uh, end of sermon. Yep. <laughs> it's a, well, it's already... Those kinds of worst case scenarios are already happening in professional tennis and now in the NBA. So you, you, I, I totally agree with you, Gary. There are bad situations in those two sports already. So how could baseball be far behind? Yeah, I think what they always forget about is not the players. It's all of the people around who don't make the kind of money that players yeah. do that can influence the out, uh, outcome of the game. I mean, just think of all those people who are – in some cases, not particularly well paid, yep. um, you can have an influence uh, mm -hmm. or know, get some inside information uh, and share it. I mean, right. that there's there's really open doors there. People think that the players won't do it because they have too much to lose. We don't know that for sure. But boy, there's lots of other people who don't have that much to lose. Yeah. Well, the yeah. biggest scandal in the NBA uh, regarding betting uh, revolved around uh, game officials, as I recall, or referees. Well, right now there is a player under investigation for prop bets. Yeah, prop bets. I mean, yep. I mean, I mean, if there's a, a tall tale sign here, you have the Four Winds Field where the South Bend Cubs are. I mean, if that's not a sign of things looking bad to me, I don't know what is. I mean, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to distort it, Gary. I just wanted to close that out. No, but I, I'm right on with you. I, I, I don't think you distort anything. I think this is a huge issue. We all care about baseball, and it's going to be a problem. I mean. I wonder if the um, punishment handed down to Billy Epler for screwing around with the disabled list or the injured list was a warning because that's an obvious place for gamblers to get an edge if they get health or injury information that's not public. And the problem is, even if you make an example, mm -hmm. one guy, teams have been, teams have been, uh, I want to say fraudulently using the disabled list for 30 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it was in the yeah. mid '90s in Philadelphia when I when I used to the Phillies were putting relief pitchers on the DL and I was and people would ask me what's the injury and I say it's a pulled ERA muscle mm -hmm. because there was just no obvious injury but they needed to, they couldn't you know they couldn't option him they needed to stash him for a while while he worked out his problem with his yep. splitter or he, he his arm got his arm got a little rest and it's become. Uh, endemic in the game not epidemic endemic yeah. yep. and i think that goes back to the minor league teams being so close you know yeah. if somebody's just 15 miles away why don't we call him up and you know say so and so is injured to make a roster spot for him right it's easy right and the and the shortening mm. of the dl was also a factor in this you know where it used to be a minimum of 15 days that uh, the longer the DL stretch is, the more incentive teams have to muck around. Um, and the shorter it is, the more incentive they have to just stash people on the DL for a rest rather than send them to AAA. So it's it's just a mess. 
Um, Richard Smiley has his hand up, and we haven't heard from him yet. Yeah, it's second. Um, okay, yeah, I'm unmuted. Good. Uh, no, getting back to the because you were mentioning the NBA. Yes, the officials, but the prop bets are what's really. I I think what we might see is a movement even in the gambling community to cut down on the prop bets because you know the basic principle that like maybe one player it's hard to influence a whole game or a whole like you know for you know you need you may need a lot of players to influence a point spread or something like that you're just one player but a prop bet of like who's going to win the opening tip well you know if I'm the person involved in that opening tip that's an easy money for me. I just make yep. sure I don't win it. I make it look yep. good, but I just make sure I don't win it. You know, and like there's a lot of, you know, prop bet is actually something that that's where these players can be influenced on. So that's really where they're, uh, you might see stuff cracking down real quickly, but. Right. I, I don't have the figures handy now, but I saw last year the, um, percent of profit or the the amount the gambling um gambling operations were making on regular bets which was not a lot five percent four percent something like that on prop bets which was i think more than twice that and then on parlays they're they're now all in on parlays you know i was watching the pregame to the tigers first game of the season on valley sports detroit today and in this studio show the pregame show they're touting a parlay you know and and the parlays, there's nobody out there who doesn't have a degree in computer science or statistics and who doesn't have a computer at hand with software ready to go that can crunch the odds on those. You know, if, if you want to, I, I'm not a prude on this. I, I believe that people are going to gamble, so you might as well make it legal and tax it and regulate it. But people who want to gamble the t- Tigers to win the AL Central or to make it win the AL pennant or go to the World Series, you have some idea, some rough idea, and you can spend a week doing research if you want before you put the bet down. On a prop bet, you have no time. So you're just you're just easy. You might as well put a pigeon's um, costume on and sit there with your smartphone and coo while you're placing the bet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, that was my second sermon. I promise there won't be a third. <laughs> It so, sounds like we should all invest in gambling stock or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> this sounds like really easy money. It's a lot better than my bank account's doing. I don't know. All right, let's 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 turn back to baseball. How many people think that some other team beside the Twins is going to win the division? Bet the field. <laughs> we'll bet the field, right. I, I see what, three hands. I, I have to change screens here. Hang on. I still only see three. So, uh, Dave, who do you think is going to win besides the Twins? Somebody besides the Twins. Somebody um, besides the, Twins. <laughs> the Tigers would be a, a candidate and the Guardians. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I think the Guardians, you know, if their pitching stays healthy, um, they're probably a better team than the Twins. Yeah. I don't believe um, Buxton will stay in center field um, all season. And uh, uh, what's the chance that the, the plantar fasciitis will come back to Korea? Um, they, they they have a lot more questions than they're than are often raised. True, but they're also in the weakest division in baseball, which helps a lot. I think right. that I think that's somewhat overblown, because you know a lot of people look at where all the money is spent, and uh, may, you know maybe we should do a study of this. But I think most players. Um, get a, a majority or certainly a lot of their value before they even become a, a free agent and become the highest paid player. Uh, well, that's true. Uh, certainly a, a second or third year pitcher uh, is in a, uh, of quality is it might is every bit as competitive as a, a, a veteran in his, in his mid thirties. So there's some deception uh, uh, regarding how we rate players that we know have done well in the past versus those who are up and coming and, showing their colors now. I, I agree with everything you said, although I will say that aside from that, the wealthier clubs have the ability to eat their mistakes and the the less wealthy clubs, which are generally small market clubs, not always, right? The less wealthy clubs can eat their mistakes. And so that's why, you know, you have clubs that 
Well, they sign a guy to an $80 million contract. He's worth virtually nothing. Two years later, they find sign another guy to a $100 million contract to replace him. That's something that the, the smaller revenue clubs cannot do. Um, so they don't get, they don't get too many bites at the apple. Um, okay. Um, anyone else, uh, you want to talk, we want to talk about some baseball outside of the AL central. I do. I, can we talk about how Mookie Betts uh, going to shortstop and seem like yeah, it's making yeah, like a seamless that transition? Is that, that I mean, he just makes it seem so easy. It's it's like I've I, it's he's a baseball never, player. Yeah, <laughs> he's a baseball yeah. player. No, you no, you're yeah. absolutely right. I mean, Hans Wagner did yeah. it. It's like <laughs> I I I had the I was watching a White Sox two two weeks ago a White Sox, um, you know. Like anybody who saw the Sox play today knows what I'm about to say, why this is important. I was watching the White Sox play the Dodgers and the White Sox were uh, burying Yamamoto. And part of the reason was there were at least two routine ground balls hit in the hole that the guy playing shortstop kind of five hopped it over to first base and the Sox got a hit on it. I think even uh, Andrew Vaughn had an infield hit. I mean, that that's almost impossible. It's like me getting an infield hit. And <laughs> I, I just had the flash then. Honest to God, it's like, you know, why are they playing Lux? Why can't he? He's a second baseman. Why not play him there? Oh, they got Mookie there. And I swear to God, this was a week before I was like, I did have the inspiration. Gee, couldn't they just move Mookie to short? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> so well, they came out and I'm like, of course they could. It's like, he's a ball player. Isn't it kind of funny that uh, Mookie moved from right field to eventually shortstop, and then another superstar in the same division, Fernando Tatis, moved from yeah. shortstop to right field, and it looks like each of them is just gonna crush it exactly. in their new position. And he has Tatis best looks great in the right field. Yeah, I mean he has a, he has best season uh, war wise too. For Tatis in yeah. the right field, it's phenomenal. Platinum glove. Yeah. I mean, best fielder in the world. Wait till Mookie Betts rolls a 300 game while he's playing shortstop. <laughs> <laughs> but but isn't it more. isn't it inspirational to see an athlete in the modern era who's worth so much money and whose contract is guaranteed take that kind of risk? Because normally they get very conservative ball players, and I think people in general as they get older. And wealthier, they get more conservative, and I'm just so so pleased that he's willing to go out there and say, "Yeah, yeah, I'll take I'll take one for the team, and I'll and I'll succeed." Mm -hmm. I, I just love that, and I'm and I'm in general skeptical of moving veteran players to the right on the defensive spectrum. Yeah, generally skeptical, but uh, in this case, I think there's a good chance it'll succeed. Yeah. Um. So. Do uh, does anyone want to opine about um, the other divisions? Does anyone think anyone can beat the Dodgers? I don't think the Dodgers look that good at this point. I mean, they have a, their former shortstop at second base. They have their former right fielder at shortstop. They have two all-star pitchers on the DL. Um, they just signed their 29-year-old catcher to a 10-year contract. That might work out, but it probably won't. I think, you know, the Dodgers and Padres are good examples of money poorly spent and with little return. I mean, the Dodgers have the only World Series they've won in the last 40 years is, was in the, the COVID year. Right, right. I know that they'll take it. They're not, they're not embarrassed about it. But that is interesting that they've spent all this money and won all these NL West titles. And the only year they broke through to the World Series is the COVID year. And of course, that points out that you know the current MLB system is designed to not let clubs like the Dodgers dominate in the postseason, yeah. and to give and to give clubs like the Guardians and the Padres hope that even if they can't compete in the payroll and they can't catch up in 162 game season, they too, like the Diamondbacks and the Phillies, can play in the World Series. My problem with that is that we're now going the reverse direction. We're now getting clubs just aiming to get into the playoffs. And if they make the wild card, that's fine. Figuring that it's almost as good as winning your division. Yeah. And that scares me. You know, Dave Dombrowski in Philadelphia calculating how to make it into the 
how to get a wild card slot, and then how to have his team dominate the postseason, as opposed to how to be the best club in his division because you need to play 162. Mm-hmm. It is strange to see that Nebraska, the, their in terms of power rankings, Fangraphs has the Phillies as number one bullpen, and that's to me blows my mind because I've never seen Nebraska bullpen strong. <laughs> I mean, it's just that's weird to me, but. <laughs> Right. Well, yeah, he, he's he's learned some stuff from his time in Detroit. He certainly learned a little bit about relief pitching. It was amazing how poorly he made choices about relief pitching in Detroit. It was just scary because because he was a good GM in so many other ways, not in terms of drafting talent and developing it, but in terms of trading and identifying veteran players to trade for or to sign. Does anybody think that another a team other than Minnesota is going to be in the playoffs in the Western Division? Or from the Central Division, excuse me? No. no. I, well, I, I, don't I think so. I'm one of those who thinks it'll be a different a team different than Minnesota. I think I think the Tigers might win it. I think the pitching is better. I think the pitching is a vulnerability with the twins. I'm not sold on their pitching. So that's that's me. But uh but, but, just one yeah, but I think the concept of Bruce's question is, do you think we're going to, uh, the central is going to get a wild card and put me down as a no. <laughs> no way, Jose. Yeah. Can I bring up a dilemma for the national league? Sure. Let's talk. It a looks, little national it league looks base. like, yeah, it looks like the Brewers probably won't make the playoffs. And if they don't make the playoffs, no one will have any idea who's going to make it to the world series. Cause I think the last Five times they've been in the playoffs, they lost to the eventual National League World Series team. So who's going to, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's well, yeah, it's going to be. I mean, yeah. there is, there is always this rich club, poor club dynamic. I always want to say large market, mm-hmm. small market, but it's not, it doesn't exactly break that way. But um, this RSN. This RSN shakeout is really scary for baseball in general and for a lot of these clubs. Uh, I mean, it's just that they were counting on that $70 million a year for the next 10 or 15 years. And even if the Angels are getting $100 million a year and the Dodgers are getting $200 million a year or whatever the Dodgers are getting and the Phillies are getting $100 million a year, plus they own part of the RSN. So you figured it's probably double that. That's $70 million was a lot more important to the Padres and the Diamondbacks and the Twins and the mm-hmm. Guardians than it was than the a much bigger fees were to the richer clubs. Putting together some of these themes, how often does the highest uh, payroll win the World Series? How often does the highest player win the MVP? And how often does the favorite from the preseason become World Series champion? That should scare any gambler because those things – don't happen as often as you might expect. Mm-hmm. No, they don't. Uh, we'll probably all be shown wrong by the end of the season. You, you know, baseball is largely unpredictable. That's how the Rangers wind up beating the Diamondbacks in twenty three. It- right. Although I, 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 and and your points are well taken. Although I will say that a lot of the, you know, Diamondbacks and the Rangers in the World Series is just having these short series. It, yeah. it, people say a seven game series is a crapshoot. Or a toss up. It's not quite, but it still is for most for most seven game series, it's within 55, 45 range. 60, 40 would be really extreme, right? But in the in the wild card series and the division series, oh, man, I mean it's just it's ridiculous. Sparky Anderson, you know, said many, many, many things, many of which were, you know, um blarney. Um and I can't resist saying this. How many people out there know what Sparky's nickname was? He Captain said he Hook. Had, Sparky. Well, that, that's the public Captain nickname. Hook. No, no. He he said he no. he was called. He, he this was his own joke. He was called Chief Walking Eagle. You know why? Because he was too full of he said feathers, but he was too ah. full of, too full of shit to fly. <laughs> and I love that joke. And it, it was it was a tribute to Sparky. He was willing to tell it about himself. But, you know, Sparky said when, you know, and this is back when you just had two series, the pressure on the club was in the um, ALCS or the LCS. Because back, 
before um, 85, you had only five games. Yeah. You have three bad games and you're out and you don't get to the World Series. And, um, you know, you still have that pressure now. Uh, I, you know, if we're up to me, you, it, I would cut the number of postseason series and make sure every every postseason series was seven games. Because yeah. it's terrible to see a great club get knocked out by somebody who gets hot for three games. Mm-hmm. You know, another reason why you can't predict what's going to happen is injuries play a big part of uh, who wins the playoffs because it's usually the healthiest team going into the playoffs that gets to the World Series and has a good chance of winning. For example, I I always believed that in 2016, if uh, Cookie Carrasco got, hadn't got hit by the uh, uh, ball, what's, uh, who hit it, that uh, knocked him out of the playoffs, and we didn't have um, Michael Brantley either, We'd have, we'd have beaten the, the Cubs. In uh, 96, uh, Tommy breaks his helmet thrown on hit by a pitch in September. He's out for the playoffs. We lose the first round to the uh, Orioles. Uh, Orioles, right. So it's usually the same thing with the NFL football. Who gets to the Super Bowl is the teams that are healthiest at the end of the year. And you can't predict who's going to be the healthiest to have the best shot. Yeah, that's true. Um, although, to me, watching teams like the Diamondbacks get to the World Series is is a crime. Uh, it's just, they're so weak. Um, and in the past, of course, baseball has this tension. They want the wild card to give people in cities where their clubs aren't that good or they don't have to spend a lot of money. They want the wild card to give them that hope and keep them in, the fans interested in the season in August, September, but they don't want the wild card teams to win too often. You know, yeah. you remember when the uh, LCS, um, the first and then the first round in the division series was a two, three series. And then the clubs who had the home field advantage would get knocked out after three or four games and they started squawking. So then it became two to one, which adds a day to the postseason calendar. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and every time a club that's favored to win sweeps a previous series and has a long layoff and they lose the next series, they blame it on having too much rest, which uh, to There's my no evidence of that. Yeah, right. Right. To my view is idiotic because my my uh, what I would say to them is. Okay, so why didn't you throw a couple of games, get to game seven, burn out your your bullpen, and then you wouldn't have too much rest? It's just yeah. such an idiotic thing. It's just an excuse, but but I mean, it shows you how how wacky the postseason is, and and to the extent that baseball sees March Madness, you know, where teams oh, do you have something to say, John? Clearly, better. Yeah, I'll, I'll wait till there's for, a chance for a bad half. And they look at the NHL where the tie system and the overtime system is distorted, you know, how teams play. And they say people don't care about the integrity of the game. They care about having the illusion that your team can go all the way. Can I um, – I have a slight proposal. I mean, my – thing about playoffs is like yeah it's the way we do it in this country and uh there's that's just how it's always gonna be now but i think more and more leagues are trying to and should be trying to emphasize just success in the regular season i mean i know the nhl and the M and MLS major league soccer each have specific trophies for the best regular season team. You had the best record in the regular season. Good job. Here's a trophy. And I think basketball is thinking about it. And I've heard some discussions about, you know, MLB should like do Ooh. that because they, there's studies that even NHL and NBA seasons, as long as they are, like that sample size of games gives you way more of a true outcome than you need. And even with 162 games, 
there's it's so much of a of a crapshoot. So if you're going to have longer and longer playoffs, at least make being good in the regular season worth something other than, oh, we made the playoffs, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I agree. It's a fine balance between punishing the wild card team. You can't you can't make it so they can't win because otherwise why let them in? But you also don't want to make it so the wild card is almost the equivalent of winning the division. And that's, you know, and that's uh, something MLB tried to fix, uh, what, 12 years ago. Yeah. Uh, can I just float something the wild up here? Just kind of like. Sure, Rich. Uh, we, you know, we're we're uh, scheduled, to, scheduled to end in five minutes. I don't think. Okay, well, this is quick. This is yeah, quick. Go ahead. Go this ahead. Is, uh, like last year, the uh yeah the world series goes on as is and you see texas is the world series champion but the national league pennant winner is the atlanta braves the american league pennant winner is the baltimore orioles like give them they are the pennant winners they are declared champion of the the leagues and then the world series is a separate thing that you know you still do all this stuff but like there is something to fight for in having the best regular season record. I, I mean, I don't know if that would make just the same thing. Yeah. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Well, I and mean, it makes as much, sorry to jump in one more time. It just makes as much ahead. sense now as it ever did. What with the like completely balanced schedule that you play everybody throughout yeah. the whole season. Mm-hmm. Now professional golf is trying to promote something called the FedEx championship. And what they do is they take, the leading well money winner or points winner and they have a tournament for the top 30 but they give the top player coming in like he starts out at eight under par where everybody mm-hmm. else starts out at even par i mean it's sort of a ridiculous idea but uh, that's how they try and get stuff for the champion they're rewarding the best player but still giving other players at least a, a theoretical shot at beating that person mm-hmm I'm not sure that could apply to baseball very well. Yeah, I don't think many, so. I'm not sure it applies to golf very well, for that matter. How many golf, of us... Golf purists are outraged at that, too. Yeah. I got a thought. How many of us think that sooner or later, the World Series is not going to end to until Veterans Day or Thanksgiving? Yeah. <laughs> They keep well, adding playoffs. Well, football keeps expanding. They still keep creeping up on baseball. So starting in back March. at them. Back it's, at them. It's starting in March. It's going in the opposite direction. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think that that's, that's what's going to be. It's going to end right at the end of October, roughly. But it but they're really pushing the season further forward. And that is probably going to be popular because – um, the players are already complaining that spring training is too long. Mm-hmm. And so pushing the season forward makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Per- personally, I think they should. I think that since the games make a lot of money, now I just got back from eight days in Florida. I can't believe the prices they're charging, you know, $50 for seats, 20 rows back in the outfield behind third base or $40, $35 for SRO seats. Um, seventy dollars for seats in the box seats in the infield. I don't think the clubs are going to cut the number of games, but the players don't have to be reporting two weeks or two and a half weeks beforehand. Yeah, they, they could they could dramatically cut down the extra time they spend in camp before the game start, since most of the players arrive in shape anyway. Yeah, well, which the is better. Is, the pitchers are. It's really only the the pitchers that need you know the longer. Like they, the ramp up in that is longer for the pitchers, but for the position players, you're totally right. They don't need to be there for just hanging around for a month and a half. Right. But the pitchers have earlier pitchers and catchers report earlier, but yeah. the, the players, the players know that if they report it on the mandatory date, that would be a black mark. They say they have to report as early as possible. Otherwise people will think, you know, they're not, you're not uh, no. team players. So. Okay, it's 9.14 Eastern. I am uh, ready to wrap up. 
I sent a message in the chat thanking everyone who participated, especially people hung on to the end. But if anyone has closing comments, speak up now. I got a question for y'all. What, when the highest paid player in baseball, has he ever won, during his contract that he's the highest paid, has he ever won an MVP or the World Series? And what are the chances of Tony doing it? Hmm. I'm sure. Arguably, Otani's not going to be the highest paid player in the game because he's only making $2 million a year. When, when A-Rod won the World Series with the Yankees, wasn't he still the highest paid player then? I believe so. Yes. I believe yeah. that's true. So, that's one. Yeah, and of course, we're forgetting. 1927? <laughs> I, I just going to say, Babe Ruth is the highest play, paid player for many years, and yeah. He won several World Series. Yeah. And, I mean, at some level, baseball is unpredictable. At another level, it helps to have extra money, right? Yeah. You'd rather have more money than less, even mm -hmm. if it's not a guarantee. Yeah. So, okay. Well, um, I'm going to wrap this up. I look forward to having a chat uh, either at midseason or at the end of the year. I proposed an all-star break chat last year. That would be to good. Didn't seem to be popular, but I'm going to propose it again this year because I think uh, it would be fun to revisit what we said uh, at the start of the season at the All-Star break. Um, in any case, thanks thanks to all of you, and I look forward to seeing you again. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys.